So welcome this evening. This is a great event for us. For those who don't know, I'm Dr. Costin. I am the Executive Director for the School of Hotel Restaurant Management in the W.A. Frankie College of Business. Thank you all for being here this evening. This is a unique opportunity for us. For those who don't know, this is our inaugural diversity keynote lecture, which is part of NSMH's Hospitality Week. And you'll learn more about that in a little bit. Uh, as we begin, I do want to make sure that, because some of you all are from FCB, that you recognize that you have to make sure that you see the ambassador outside to get your little sheet of paper. Sure, students, make sure you swipe your card so that you can get credit. I believe we also have some uh, sign-up sheets out there for different courses, so make sure you do that on your way out if you didn't do that on your way in. We also have some refreshments out there. They're for you, so I hope you partook. That's what happens when you're in HRM, right? For you FCB students, you might want to get a minor so you can have some free food, because uh, we do like to have fun. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to start. Uh, as an indication of how important this topic is on our campus, unfortunately, President Chang couldn't be here tonight, because tomorrow she meets with Abor. I think she'd rather be here. Uh, but she did send uh, a representative from the Office of the President, and that is Ms. Joanne King, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff for President Chen. Well, good evening. I'm used to walking around on campus in a suit, and everybody looks at me like I'm crazy. So I feel I feel very welcome in this room. So um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today for this inaugural event. Um, as, as Dr. Costin mentioned, the president is in Tucson meeting with her bosses. Her bosses are the Arizona Board of Regents. Um, she meets with them several times a year, and, and she'll be down there for the rest of the week, so she sends her regrets, and I know she was looking forward to hearing Denise's talk, and, and um, I'll definitely be here to, to listen to her talk as well. Um, so one of the things she did ask me to do was just give an update on some of the things that we're doing on campus on diversity and inclusion. You may have heard some of these um, things, but if not, um, hopefully... You know, we can reiterate them and just show you how important uh, diversity and inclusion is to the president. Um, so one of the things that she's been working on is really increasing access to the university and retaining students, staff, and faculty of diverse backgrounds. Part of that is looking at um, a new initiative, and the new initiative she announced in January is to expand access, diversity, and inclusion on campus. And there's several parts to this. I'll be brief because I know um, you're really here to, to hear Denise speak. But she, um, the president has established the Center for University Access and Inclusion. Um, part of this is really coordinating our diversity and, and inclusion efforts on campus. It's um, having an office that can work with the commissions, can work with the students, can work with the faculty. And then having somebody in a position to communicate directly to the president. Um, she has appointed Priscilla Mills, some of you might know Priscilla, who's serving as the executive director of the center. And um, we've also moved a lot of our compliance responsibilities also into that office, so that'll help coordinate for, for all, of, all of you and all of staff and faculty as well. The other um, big item that we're doing is we're currently recruiting for a chief diversity officer on the cabinet level. Um, this was a reorganization um, done by the president. Um, that chief diversity officer, officer position is currently open, it's posted, it's on the NAU website, and we're getting a lot of applicants um, for this position. Prior to posting the position, we, we sent it out to um, campus, and we, we got a lot of feedback from uh, students, faculty, staff, administrators, who helped craft the job description, and then um, volunteered to be part of the search committee. So we have a search committee that includes representatives from across campus. So the plan with that position is what we're currently recruiting. We are... Um, Hopefully, in, in my world, if you can get a search done in uh, six months, it's, it's a miracle. Uh, we're hoping to bring somebody, um, several candidates on campus in May, and we're hoping that students will be a part of that process, so, so more to come on that. 
Um, the other thing I will say is, you know, the president is very um, open to meeting with diverse groups across campus, and she's um, she's been meeting with many groups. If there are any opportunities, feel free to contact me, Dr. Costin, and we'll facilitate a meeting. Um, and I'm available to answer any questions, and I'll be here the whole time if you'd like to ask me anything. So thank you. I'm Samantha David. Um, I am a sophomore and my major is hotel and restaurant management. Um, I am currently on the hospitality chair at one of three for NSMH. So I'm just going to go into more detail of what NSMH really is. So National Society of Minorities and Hospitality, also known as NSMH, is the largest student club in SHRM. And it was founded in 1989 at Cornell University and in 1998 here at NAU. We address diversity and multiculturalism as well as career development. And the snitch aims to <coughs> sorry, aims to be a total resource center for college students by aiding in recruitment, support, and advancements in the hospitality industry. And the builds and maintains relationships between hospitality professionals and minority college students, encouraging them to have a lifelong um, commitment to NSNH. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caitlin Scarangelli, and I'm an HRM major, and I'm a sophomore, and I am one of the three uh, hospitality group chairs of NSMH. With more than 30 years of experience in operations and staff assignments, Ms. Amakapani has been chef manager, general manager, area general manager, and district manager, as well as led the training and development team for Sodexo's corporate services division. For the last five years, she has supported the universities and schools division of Sodexo for all things related to diversity and inclusion. In that role, she has driven and built internal awareness and accountability for diversity and inclusion. She was a founding member and the first chair of the Sodexo Employee Network Group Pride. She is an advisor to the inclusion community and is a member of the Impact Mentoring Team. Her passions are developing people and making a difference in people's lives by bringing inclusion to the forefront of the workplace every day. Prior to Sodexo, Denise owned a contract food service company and restaurant in the New Jersey area. In her 23 years with Sodexo, her expertise includes operations, training and development, recruitment, talent development, customer service, client relations, and strategic planning and execution. In 2014, she earned her credential as Certified Diversity Professional from the Institute for Diversity. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Food Administration and Hotel Tourism from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Ms. Denise Mokapani. That's a lot, man. Huh? I've been around the block a few times. <clears throat> So interesting, so you get extra credit for coming tonight, so I'm wondering if that's why you're here. Or we have food, so that's always another draw to bring people in. But you know what, I'm used to that, because in my, in my role in diversity and inclusion, it was all about the credit, right? If I showed up at something, they would get credit for being there. And so in the beginning, I was kind of like, all right, well, that's okay. But as time went on, it became more that we need you there. They saw the value in that. So tonight, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about Sodexo's story and our journey in diversity and inclusion, because um, I think some things you'll be surprised at. And I'm also going to share some of my personal story and journey with Sodexo through this process. So, um, uh, so it's kind of fun. So, and then at the end we'll have Q and A. So feel free to ask anything you like. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, this is an open forum and. Um, I'm appreciative that you guys are here and I want to be able to answer anything um, that you can. So, so, so Sodexo, 420,000 employees worldwide, 135,000 in the U.S., we're in 80 countries, we feed 75 million customers a day. And you might say, well, who the heck wants to work for that company? Nobody will even know you're alive in this company. And if I was to email the CEO in North America or the CEO of schools or the CEO of universities right now, they'd probably respond to me by first thing tomorrow morning. So even though we're a huge company, 
we're very kind of, I say, family oriented because we have such longevity in the company and there's such great opportunities. And as you hear about my career, um, it's just been a great run for me in my, I'll be hitting 24 years in May um, with Sodexo. And so it's been a great run. And so even though we're a big company, what that means is big opportunities. Because if you would have asked me when I was going to RIT, I thought I wanted to be in some sort of the restaurant business, whatever that meant. And so if you had asked me that I'd work in diversity and inclusion, learn about and lead training and development in the US, that would have never even entered into my realm. But because I had operations background, I knew I understood the business. I understand what it takes, what goes on here every day, I get it, because I've been in those shoes before. It really helped me to drive some of these other things in the company. So wherever you start out in your careers, you know, don't underestimate learning operations because then a lot of those things um, can translate uh, to that. So we do a lot of interesting things. Uh, we feed all the employees at Disney World. So if you went to the Disney World Park, if you went to one of the hotels at the Disney property, right, somewhere on that property is a cafeteria where all those employees actually eat. So they don't eat in the parks. Uh, we feed all the Marines in the U.S. They worked for that division when we got that contract years back. And so on one day, we opened up 55 mess halls in one day. So we feed all the Marines. Now we've taken on part of the Air Force, so we have part of the Navy. Um, we do remote sites. So if you have a desire to be out in the middle of nowhere on an oil rig, we do that. Uh, we clean the Taj Mahal. We're active in the Olympics with food. So whatever there are people and food or facility management, Sodexo is probably there. As the 18th largest employer in the world, nobody's ever heard of us, right? So we're the best kept secret. And you know, we kind of we kind of like proud of that because we're very modest. We're not real big about, look at us, pounding our chest, aren't we wonderful? We just kind of go about our business, making a difference in people's lives whenever and wherever they come together. That's kind of our thing. Uh, but we do zoos, we do museums, uh, we have 6,000 locations just in the U.S. So I've worked in uh, numerous divisions in the company and had great experiences. And again, at the end of the day, for me, it's about food, it's about people, right? So if you know people and you get that, that can translate whether I'm working at a university, whether I'm working in a corporate environment or a healthcare environment, it all kind of translates, right? Food is food, people are people. And how do you just make it go together um, in that way? So here's my story. Uh, and so she shared a little bit about it. And when I first got into this job, um, I went from leading a team of 600 people to a team of myself. And I sat in my office in Florida. Um, I lived in Naples, Florida, right where that alligator's nose is. That's where I lived in uh, Florida. So if you flew into Fort Lauderdale, you came right across Alligator Alley. That's where I lived. And so I sat in my little home office, and I looked out the window at the lake, and I saw the palm trees, and I thought, okay, well, now what do I do? I mean, this diversity and inclusion job, nobody had been in this job before, it was a brand new job. And so I said to my boss, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, wait for the phone to ring? He says, get out there and share your story. I'm thinking, my story? What the heck's my story? He said, you got a good story. I'm like, I do. So I sat down and I put this together. And it's kind of evolved over time. And because what happens is, so often, we're ready to judge people, right? Based on how they look, how they sound, Right? We want to put them in that proverbial box where they think everybody belongs. So when people hear my accent, right? Oh, you must be from New York. Oh, you must be from New Jersey. It's never like, oh, you must be from New Jersey. Isn't that nice? Right? <laughs> now, personally, I love people from the Midwest, right? Because in Florida, most of those people came from Minnesota to Ohio. And to me, they're like the nicest darn people in the world, right? But, and if I'd say, oh, you're from Minnesota, oh, Minnesota, isn't that nice? But when they go, oh, New Jersey, New York. And then they would see my name. And they say, oh, you must be Italian. Oh, it must be Sopranos, Mafia, big family, right? All the stereotypes that go, Catholic, all the stereotypes that go with it. And so often you're wrong when you think you make these assumptions about people. So, um, so the house on the top left there, that's the house I grew up in, and that's the house that my dad still lives in. He's been in that house for 65 years, still in the same town, same parish, everything the same. And it's probably what keeps them going because it's the same people who have been in the town all those years. Um, so that's where I grew up. I love to play golf. Dunkin' Donuts is my favorite coffee. I was disappointed on my two-hour trek from Phoenix. I did not see one Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, so now it's, it's kind of late for me already, so I'll try to keep the energy up here. Um, I believe that when life gives you lemons, you have to make lemonade. 
And I think in the hospitality industry, or really any industry, but we really see it, you know, we're making lemonade every day, and some days we're adding a whole heck of a lot of sugar in the water just to get through the day. Because you have no idea what it takes to put the food out on this campus. You think, oh, we just twitch our nose, and it all just appears there. There's a lot of stuff going on, like at Disney World, right? So you think those employees, 